Guru Nation, welcome to another episode of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. We can't guess, Chris, because I don't even know what episode we are. 781. We've been producing a lot of content. 782. If you include the IA, we've been producing so much content, it's been crazy. Um, they haven't done a short video like in a long time, until, so I did one today. Um, but this podcast, we're going to touch on a lot of topics. We're going to get through uh, a lot of ideas, a lot of listener questions, viewer questions. Send them all to uh, 949... No. Oh, oh, that's okay. That's oh. okay. Don't continue. Actually, continue. send them all to Chris <laughs> at brkthru.org. No. I almost said my phone number instead. Yeah, I know you did. You can, 949-415-6256. Text. text is preferred. I used to say call or text. Uh-huh. Now I change it to text because it's getting crazy. The phone, uh, it's out of control, but text is fantastic because it's... And email's even better. I actually prefer text. Over email? Yeah. Uh, I prefer email. Um, okay. What if you're in the middle of doing something, you see the text, and then you forget about it? You don't forget. Well, you're, you, 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 never mind. I get it now for you. You get you, it. You, the way you handle your email is completely different than the way I handle it. I won't yes. overlook an email. I could overlook a text. I'm the opposite. Yeah. I can believe that. Um, okay. Okay. That's a great uh, introduction <laughs> to this podcast. Is it a good segue to the topic? Yeah, email chris at brkthru.org. Oh, great. Final thoughts on DIA. I know we've exhausted the hell out of this. But, guys, gals, it's coming, okay? The other sites, <clears throat> I'm on a thread. I'm not going to go any further than that. I'm on a thread with sites that have joined or went to DIA. They're giving a recap. So it's not just us saying these things, right? They're talking about rare diseases. Right now it's derm, psych, and rare. Oncology is always in the mix as far as the uh, pulse of, of the industry. Maybe we'll, we'll do a little pulse, a little vital signs of the research industry. Yeah. People are reporting now in the summer months it's a little slow, which for us, for me and Chris, is hard to believe because... We're super busy, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we do a lot of psych, a lot of CNS, um, heavy CNS type of stuff. That's not the. I mean, if you're sp- speaking specific to uh, sites and their busyness, yeah, sure. Because experienced sites are complaining that it's slow. Okay. Sites that have been around for a long time. We talked to two of them today. Sure. Or one of them today. The other one we talked to was a naive research naive. They don't know any better. They don't know if it's slow or busy. It's right in a macro sense. Like if you take 2019 and you compare it to like 2012, well, much we're busier. In a super busy year. If you compare July 2019 to January 2019, it's gonna appear slow. Right. But I'll take July 2019 over July 2012. Like a hundred times out of a hundred, or over any month in July. 12, I remember 2012. 2012 was like the worst year I've ever had it personally, uh, as a business person. Bad, 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 bad. And it started in 2008, right? Or no? 2005. No, no. When did the bad times kind of initial? Uh, initiate? like 2010. 2010. Business wise, yeah. But 2012 was like the peak. Um, so yeah, I'll th- like people complain because it's you know they're just looking at short term, sure. uh, which they need to do because they're look. Let's face it, okay. Well, this is the bigger topic. Clinical research sites are commodity. Commodity, sure. Right. Let's put it this way: pharma, biotech, they're paying for all this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. They prefer they don't have sites. Which is what some of the topics at DIA were, which we can get into. Mm-hmm. They well, prefer we don't exist. Well, they're a business, and that's one of their key expenses. I'm not blaming them. I'm just laying it out there how it is. Sure. Right? So, if you're a site, there's not, like, what really can you do? Well, you have no control over the 
the um, food chain. Or do you? I don't know. I don't think you do. Well, we met some sites at DIA that are taking a different stance on that. We did. They're creating site networks. We are doing that as well as starting a CRO. Sure. But right. ultimately, that does not that does not contr- that does not uh, give you any leverage over the sponsor. Should the sponsor figure out a way that they don't need sites at all anymore? The site network, maybe not. Right. But the other stuff, yes. Even the CRO, less so. But but it doesn't have to be binary. Like it doesn't have to go from we need sites to now we don't need any sites. Oh, of course, it's, that's what not people how it are works. afraid of is we're going to need less and less sites. That's a possibility. Why? Because the commodity. If you're thirsty, do you care if it's Arrowhead or like Seven Eleven water? It could be tap water. Right. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the same thing. Like, how do you how does a site differentiate oneself? The doctor we spoke to today that's going to join us, research experienced, right? Mm-hmm. For like thirty years, longer than I've been alive, she's been doing research in Florida. All right. There's only so much you can do to differentiate yourself as a site. Yeah, you can get certified by ACRP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a PI, right? Certified PI. You can have your staff become coordinators. All right, that's that's about the extent of what you can do. This is not like um, I don't know I, I don't know what it can be compared to, but in, in almost every other industry, you have you can differentiate yourself through branding. Um, you know, there's different ways to differentiate yourself in research as a site. You're being hired to collect data, and that's it. Hmm. Like if they can have a robot do it, they would. If they can have machines get that same data, which they're trying, they would. So you can't blame the sites for being short-sighted, but the smart ones are um, thinking ahead. You know, how do I, how do I, how do I survive? How do I Diversify. remain in business? Sure. Right, and it's. The most you can do is like train your staff really well. What what were the themes we kept getting from the CROs? Quality. Yeah, but they don't mean quality of data necessarily. What did they mean? Uh, more about getting the numbers quickly, right? Meeting their enrollment numbers quickly. But uh, that one CRO that did the video with me, she said quality of sites. Which company? I'm not going to mention it. Well, I will. If it was Covance, she because I asked her specifically. Yeah. She meant enrollment. She meant so I asked enrollment. her to define what she meant by that, and she said enrollment. Enrollment and study startup. Uh, she just said enrollment. Really? Yeah. So, so I, I, I honestly thought it would be the data. So that's how you differentiate yourself. And now we're since we can mention the CROs. I mean, we uh, well we signed the CDA for this one, so we can't. But. We just did today. But right. there's another one that wants uh, research naive physicians yeah. for virtual trials. And that's a totally different ball of wax there. But it's the same, though, because it's it's just more proof that research sites are a commodity. Oh, absolutely. Without a doubt. You know, and then to differentiate yourself, I mean, yeah, you can like become a thought leader. You can be a KOL if mm-hmm. you're a PI. You can have a site network. You can have patient rapid patient um, and or rapid startup time and good quality patients like not um, recycled patients from other studies Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean those are the some of the things you can do to differentiate yourself But at the end of the day we're in a market right now where there's such a huge supply of studies everything they're talking about as far as like we need less sites and we you know we need Basically, we need less sites. What they, meaning sponsors, are talking about, we're seeing the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, we need more sites than ever before. Oh, yeah. I mean, all this stuff is great, like AI. Well, let me continue reading the, from this thread. This is not my words. This is somebody else. Lots of talk of patient-centered clinical trials and virtual trials, making it easier for patients to participate, and how sponsors are talking to patients to develop protocols. This is patient centricity. A little hogwash, but go on. Well, they're talking to patients. Uh, what sure, would you like to see? They're in the talking study? to them and talking about this, but uh, and developing these things. Uh, they've been talking about this for a long time. Yes, having EMR and EDC talk to each other, 
lots of talk about artificial intelligence. They call it that, but it's just getting data from from doctors' offices. We met a company that does this. They'll pay a site like two grand right. if they can have permanent access to their to EMR. Get, right. To permanent for patients. Yeah. They'll do a site selection visit. They'll come to your site and they'll install hardware yeah. in your server. Yeah. If you don't have a server, they'll put one. Yeah. Here now we have all your patients' data in real time. So yeah. if a patient comes in tomorrow, we have it. Yeah. <laughs> How to identify another thing they're talking about. So they're partnering with labs. A lot of these labs and Ciro is not merged. Okay. So one of the things they're doing, and I don't even know if this is legal, but they're they're getting like, for example, for diabetes studies, they're connecting with the labs and getting all the HGA one Cs to find out which areas, which geographic areas have a greater population, and that's where they're gonna choose their sites. But that doesn't solve the problem because those sites yeah, there's patients in that city. Yeah, but how do they get to these patients? How do yeah, they, and then how, how the PIs? And then how do the patients get educated about research? Like you still have the same problem. Right. Just because there's a lot of patients there doesn't mean somebody's gonna have access to them. Yeah, and patients, they think clinical research is like really bad. Most do. Most patients, they're uneducated, but that's how, what they think. Like sure. when you tell them, we're gonna give you an experimental. We're going to put you in a study with experimental treatment. We talked about this on top of the hotel in LA. That's right. Go watch that one. Don't know what episode that was, but it was a great one. Mm -hmm. And the vodka clubs were fantastic. And expensive. And expensive. <laughs> Chris, how much? Tell the listeners. I think they were like 30 some dollars a drink. So there were three of us, me, you, and uh, Bill from BioClinica. Right. We each ordered two drinks. Correct. I had vodka club because I'm a keto life. I think Bill had the same. And it was $178. Right? Bill had the same as me. He did. So four vodka clubs. And I had two... Um, Long Island iced teas. That's right. Two of those. So two, four of those six drinks in, involve club soda. Club soda and vodka. Yeah, yeah, but club soda. Yeah, not which expensive Which is like stuff. 99 cents at Walmart. Right, for, for a bottle of it. Probably the amount we drink is not even enough for the 99 cent bottle. Exactly. It was like it would have been left over. Exactly. Right, and then I'm sure they use premium vodka. I didn't ask because we were doing podcasts. Mm, they may not have. No, and a place like that, they would. That talk about differentiating yourself as a brand. Hotels can do this. They can have a rooftop pool. They can have you know extra special service. They can have cabaret. That's one business where you can differentiate yourself. Oh, sure. Most businesses are not like clinical research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, oh, so tell them. Okay, so six drinks. $178. Four of which are super easy to make. I can make $178. it. $178. Two of the Long Islands are a little more complicated, but still simple. How much? $178. $178 for all these drinks. Yeah, six drinks. So SLS totally, Hotel Beverly Hills. So, so basically $30 a drink. That's, That's right. before tip. Before tip. Yeah. And he dropped a nice tip. So... Uh, I don't know. Oh, we were talking about patients branding research as a branding problem. Mm -hmm. So anyways, enough about this DIA stuff. Um, they're trying to get rid of you as a site. Easier said than done. Yeah, I see. You and I kind of disagree on this. My I just theory don't see is this we need, happening. We need more sites yeah. with real patients. Because yeah. one thing we're noticing is studies are getting more complex. We're getting a greater supply of studies. Mm -hmm. Studies are getting harder. Yeah, it's harder. Instead of sites getting 10, 15 patients, right, each. Yeah. Now they're getting three or four. Three or four. Right. So what does that tell you? You, you need, need more, more sites. sites. Yeah. We're the perfect business model, DSCS. Yeah. We cater to naive. We cater to experienced and everyone in between. Mm -hmm. But a lot of our clientele, because we're affordable, are research naive. Yep. And then we handhold you with all kinds of stuff. Site Owner Academy, CRA Academy, starting September 2019, CRC Academy, and then our consulting retainer services, which is sometimes becomes counseling sessions for our clients. Oftentimes. More often than not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next topic. So, bottom line, maybe slow right now in the summer, but... We still, don't see it. We actually still, don't see it. There's still studies to be had. Yeah. We hear things from people mm -hmm. that it's slow. We are seeing the opposite. And it's not just because we're in psych. Right. Like we're getting studies for our clients. I have a question for you from a viewer. 
for me. We both know the answer, but let's like break it down. Hey Dan, is the fifteen seventy? Not for me. My name's Chris. Yeah, yeah sorry. Hey Chris, <laughs> is the fifteen seventy two form needed for well, all studies? We kind of talked about this earlier. Yeah, but no one's who benefited uh, from that. Of course. Me and you, we already know the answer. Well, do we? Aha, so that's a great product. Let me read. Can I read the question? Sure. Okay, is the 1572 form needed for all studies? I am reading it's not needed for some studies. Can you please clarify? So, what I would say to that, and I don't mark my words because I could be wrong. Chris at (laughs) brkthru.org. So, I would say if if the study is going to be submitted for review to the FDA, then... Yes, if it's a phase one through three. And even phase four, probably in that case, I would say yes. Submitted. The data submitted for, to the for FDA. For review, right? But what if it's not planning to be submitted to the FDA, but they still need an IND from the FDA? Then yes. I would say probably you need a 1572 in that scenario. I would say the only situation in which you do not need a, a 1572 is, for example, a phase four in which the drug's been approved and it's more a marketing study. I don't believe you would need a 1572 there. Mm -hmm. Now, I could be wrong. There may be instances with phase one through three trials in which you do not need a 1572. I'm not aware of what that would be, though. Can you think of a scenario? Phase one through three, no 1572 Like an investigator-initiated trial where it's like a one-man shop. Mm Mm-hmm. And but it's not, being submitted to the FDA? No, no, not being submitted to the okay. FDA. Okay, and there's no yeah, IND? Yeah, I think if and there's no is involved at all. And there's no IND? There's no IND, or okay. it's something that's already approved. Okay, then yeah, in that scenario, I don't necessarily think you'd need a 1572 Right, right. So there are cases, and that was my response to this guy. There are cases, and here's the bigger topic, is... The FDA is, and we talk about this in our book too, the Comprehensive Guide to Clinical Research, which is, by the way, by far, especially the audiobook, it's available on Amazon and Audible, the Comprehensive Guide to Clinical Research. It's a, uh, it's our best product. Yeah, but we don't make any money off of that. We make very little. So buy the book, the the heart, the. The cover book. Yeah, you should buy the paperback and support. Yeah, there you go. Be friends of the show. <laughs> yes. Not enemies. But if you're smart, which I know you all are because you watch and listen. Yeah, they're going to buy the audio. The audio book is the best. Value. Because we read it and then we go off script. But you should buy both because you should have one on your desk to reference. And then the audio book just when you're in the car or in the shower. But the book you can pick up repeatedly and you know flip back and forth. It's also like a textbook. The audiobook, kind of hard to do that in an audiobook. Sure. Sometimes you forget, where did I read this? and Or listen, and then you got to go. The book is still good for those kind of things. Sure. So, you need both. Yes. Yes. And if you want to be a true super fan, now we're going super one fan. step higher. You're going to get the Kindle, the paperback, and the audiobook. Well, that's one step too far. Send screenshots of proof to Chris <laughs> at brkthru.org. No, you don't need to do that. And he'll invite you for dinner. Yeah, he won't. Maybe at, if you come to one of our meetups, Chris will buy you a sandwich. We're going to have two meetups this year. Yeah, well, don't promise that. We don't know that for We're sure. We're planning. We're planning. And one in California, one in Florida. Okay. We're, we should... We'll do it. We'll do it, guys. Okay. Chris says don't promise, but I think we'll do it. It shouldn't promise. No, it shouldn't promise, but we'll do it. Um, okay, so next question. Next question. Oh, so that's actually related to another question we got. All right. Can a pediatrician do adult studies? Of course. So why is it so why is it so obvious for you and then for people maybe watching and listening well, they're they're actually asking these things. Right. Um, okay. What's, what's the issue Fair there? Enough. Why? why? Well, I want to I want to get to sure. that. Well, I, I think the best way to approach this question would be to give an example. Um, we have at one of our own sites a psychiatrist who's done constipation studies, mm-hmm. has done asthma studies, mm-hmm. has done, I think, COPD studies. Uh, yeah. I think it was the same study, asthma and COPD. Okay. 
So, and he's a psychiatrist, mm-hmm. right? So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you a few things, right? One, a physician of any, an MD can do a, a study in any field, mm-hmm. right? But the main concern sponsors have is twofold, right? One is, well, do you have access to these patients? If you can prove, right, that you have access to these patients, they'll willingly give you a trial. But you also need to meet, meet a second criteria, uh, less so than getting the patients, that you have some sort of expertise in this area, right? That's the requirement of the FDA. The right? requirement of the FDA, repeat that again. That you have to have some sort of expertise in the area, right? So that is not an actual requirement. Of I, I think it is. It, it, you have to show experience through CV. Yeah, with if you're this the indication. Sponsor, if you're the sponsor and you were to get audited by the FDA, and the FDA were to ask you, why did you choose this guy to be your PI for an asthma study? If he's a psychiatrist, you as the sponsor have to be prepared to defend your rationale. Exactly. Exactly. But there's no real guidance from the FDA on this other than what you just said. Right. So, again, the, the key component is can you get patients? So, the bigger, the bigger concern in demonstrating this would be how do you get to that point, right? Because you kind of need to be at the SI or SSV yeah. to demonstrate this, right? So, how do you get to that point? Because you've got to fill out a feasibility questionnaire first. Now, how do you even get that feasibility questionnaire as a psychiatrist for an asthma study? Yeah. So that's that's the harder part, I think. Right? Mm-hmm. It's how to get to that point. So, and so this topic's very much related to the last one of the fifteen seventy two forms, and this is a common theme we actually discussed in our audio book and in the book. The FDA is so vague on almost everything. Oh yeah, they give very little guidance. People always ask me, Dan, is this allowed? Is this allowed? I say, you know, most things are allowed. You just have to have rationale why and be prepared if the FDA audits you, whether you're a sponsor, CRO, or a site, what's your rationale? Sponsors are much more strict than the FDA. Sponsor audits? No, sponsors in general. Oh, they're regulate. yeah. They're in terms of their rules, are much more strict. Be. They have to be. They have the most to lose from any of the states. Sure, they're, they're investing the money. Yep. And they want to make sure what they're presenting to the FDA is not going to be questioned. That's right. When in doubt, ask your CRA. But just know the theme, and we'll end this podcast on this because we got to go. Um, the FDA is very vague about most things. Mm-hmm. GCP is the rules. Oh, yeah. And then in your country, whatever else they have. Mm-hmm. In the U.S., GCP. Well, I mean, there's more rules than that, right? GCP really doesn't touch on storing documents. I mean, it does a it does. little bit, but it doesn't really get into the timelines. So you need to refer to the, the uh, CFR. Right. right, right. If, for the if you most want part, information. for the most part, like there, you, there's the CFR, there's UCP. Um, it's a lot of the stuff are is that the FDA, the guidelines are vague. Oh yeah, intentionally so. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's intentional. Yes. They want the sponsors to be leery and, right? and liable. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for listening, watching. Thank you, Chris. Catch you all later. Bye-bye.